Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 17th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. I would ask everyone please to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent. We do actually have apologies from Fulton McGregor, uh, who won't be joining us from this meeting. The first item on the agenda is to decide whether to take an item in, of business in private. And the, uh, the committee is asked to consider whether it is, uh, they are content to take the stage one scrutiny of the forestry and land bill um, agenda item, which is agenda item four in public. So, so approach paper. Oh, sorry, approach paper, I should have said. Uh, thank you. I, in private, which is agenda item four. Are members agreed to that? Agreed. Good. All members are agreed. Um, agenda item two, Highlands and Islands. Yes, sorry. sorry. Picky. Yes. My agenda says it's agenda item five. Is yours different? In, indeed, it is agenda item five, and I will speak. To Just the checking. Clerks. I will Just speak to the clerks later about my convener's brief, and and and, and thank you, Mr. Stewart, uh, Mr. Stevenson, for picking me up. Um, so, agenda item five, and. Just so we're, we're all agreed that we are going to take agenda item five in private. <laughs> agreed. Thank you. Highlands and Islands Enterprise, which is the second item on the agenda. Uh, I'd like to welcome Charlotte Wright, the interim chief executive, uh, Carol Buxton, the director of regional development, and Douglas Cowan, the director of strengthening communities. Um, I'd like to ask you, Charlotte, if you'd like to make an opening statement to, to the Committee on Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Thanks very much. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, and thank you very much for your invitation to come before this committee today. It's my first opportunity to speak to you all, uh, and it seems like a really good opportunity to update you on our wider activities. Now, I know many of you know Highlands and Islands Enterprise well, but I thought it might be helpful just to set out some context on what we do and how we do it. Um, we have a long history of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, going back 52 years to the formation of Highlands and Islands Development Board to solve the Highland problem and arrest decline. Um, it was an innovative solution to create a unique entity combining both business and community development. And this approach continues to be central to how we operate today. So whilst the overall picture of the Highlands and Islands has improved considerably since that time, um, we do recognise that there are still parts of our region where uh, there are fragility. Uh, we have uh, some complex issues to do with population decline in some of those areas, which continues to be a challenge, and some areas do have narrower opportunities. So our commitment is to drive growth throughout all parts of the Highlands and Islands. Our overall uh, guiding strategy is, of course, Scotland's economic strategy, uh, and we deliver significant activity under the four eyes of Scotland's economic strategy. So that's about innovation. We have a number of programmes which support innovation, uh, internationalisation, supporting businesses to export, inclusive growth, which is important to us, not only in terms of fair work, but that geographic inclusion uh, and investment and in ensuring that we use our own investment powers to leverage growth. Um, we operate through our four key priorities, and that's the way our operating plan is set out. And these uh, are, and I'll just briefly explain them, they are growing businesses and social enterprises to deliver their growth aspirations. Primarily, we do that through our account management approach, but we do also have a number of programmes which are available to the wider business base as well. As I mentioned, uh, strengthening communities in fragile areas, which is a second of our priorities and very core to our activities. Uh, thirdly, developing growth sectors. And in doing that, we make sure that that focuses on distinctive regional opportunities for the Highlands and Islands. And fourthly, uh, creating the conditions for a competitive uh, and low carbon region. That's about our infrastructure investments, our digital work, uh, and supporting the development of higher and further education. So to give you just briefly a flavour of what that means, uh, for last year, we uh, supported the creation or retention of almost 1,700 jobs. Uh, the businesses we support, supported uh, anticipate turnover growth of 120 million, of which 80 million will come through international sales, supported 12 investment, uh, inward investment projects, and are currently account managing 415 businesses 
170 social and community enterprises and 50 whole communities through our community account management approach. So I could say more, but I, I'm get, sensing that you want to move on, so I'll stop there. Uh, sorry, I hope I didn't make it that obvious. <laughs> I, know, I know there's a lot of questions, uh, and, and it's because it's a matter of great interest to the committee. And actually, the first question is going to come from uh, the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, we all know that in the Highlands and Islands, uh, there are a lot of fragile areas, and you mentioned that um, in your introduction. Um, places in my constituency, especially um, very, very small communities like those in Northwest Sutherland, for example, um, where one family leaves and immediately the local school is under threat of closure and, and, and various other situations. So how does HIE identify and support fragile communities? And are there any areas that were previously considered fragile that are no longer considered fragile? And if so, what was done to make them no longer fragile? Charlotte, is that you? That, well, I'll start off, and I'm sure colleagues okay. might uh, want to join in as well, because I think your question goes to the heart uh, of a, a lot of what we do in uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. So in terms of the process of identifying and supporting fragile areas, we do have a, a, a process where we look at a range of, um, sort of statistical measures which will identify some of those aspects of what we term fragility. And they're to do with um, distance from main service centres, sparsity of population. So that in itself brings out um, mainly the periphery uh, of the Highlands and Islands. So as you rightly point out, Northwest Sutherland, uh, a lot of the Western uh, fringe of the mainland and the islands as well. So that pretty much makes up the majority of the fragile areas. Uh, and in supporting those communities, what we tend to do is um, either work with an existing organisation or community uh, company to see what we can do with them, develop a plan and put in place support. Sometimes that might not be there. So working to develop the capacity within the community is a really important first step because actually that process is in itself does um, draw a lot from the community and actually can be a big call on communities themselves. These are small communities, many holding down two or three different jobs, as well as wanting to support uh, the way forward for their own uh, locale. So it is a big ask of communities, so making sure that we invest in their capacity building and giving that, that support, perhaps through a community account manager or helping the employment of a local development officer can be really critical in those early planning stages. Uh, you asked whether there are any that are no longer fragile, um, and I suppose that's a really difficult question for us, really, and that there are some areas uh, where we have seen distinct improvement, but I think we sort of shied away from saying, right, you're no longer fragile, or are having really hard boundaries about that, and need to deal with the actual opportunities and challenges as they emerge. But maybe see if Cara wants to add, or Douglas. Yeah, I think that's <clears throat> that's a really good point because you know the, the fragility. A lot of it is sort of relative to performance in the rest of the region, and some of the, those aspects, like for example, distance from a major service population, aren't necessarily solvable. And it's what we can do to mitigate those those aspects, and things like obviously digital connectivity are, are very important. I suppose. Um, there have been communities where things have significantly improved, and I think probably Egg in terms of population, for example, the Isle of Egg, where, where the population has grown, albeit to still a relatively small number, but in per percentage terms, dramatically, given some of the support and projects that have happened there. Douglas, do you want to come in briefly on that? Yeah, maybe, maybe just to supplement uh, that as well. I, th I think um, while we do focus a lot of our strengths in communities' activity in our fragile areas, um, we also utilise the full HIE toolbox, so we do support businesses there. We do look for sectoral opportunities specifically that can impact on some of those areas, working on, for example, the North Coast 500 and, and how we leverage the opportunities that come out of that and, and other, I guess, specific sector opportunities that apply um, across the region. <clears throat> Isla, for example, is, is also classed as a fragile area where it's got a number of, of major multinational businesses. So we work with the whiskey industry um, to help them support the growth of that island. So there's um, a whole host of different interventions we adopt, very much 
based on the opportunities and challenges on the specific community. Okay. So, do you want to follow on with yeah, your... Um, so, you use different indicators than <coughs> government and council and the NHS, I believe, use the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, which is very difficult in rural areas to pinpoint very, very small pockets of deprivation. Um, would you say that your indicators are, are better placed for rural areas and would you recommend maybe Highland Council or NHS Highland adopting those? I've had a number of conversations round about that, particularly through the various uh, community planning partnerships that operate throughout the Highlands and Islands. I, mean, I think we would agree with your comment there that the indicators of multiple deprivation are really very helpful in the urban context, but don't bring out some of the characteristics really that Carol was highlighting there in terms of sparsity of population and the real challenges for rural areas. So um, our experience has been through community planning actually to bring both of those things together through the community planning process so that for the Highlands and Islands there are one or two areas that do actually uh, suffer from some of the more urban challenges. A certain area of Inverness, for example, would stand out that does fit those kind of characteristics. So we would work with community planning partners to support that. But um, as one of the statutory partners in community planning have made it quite clear that the rural context is really important. So uh, the locality, locality planning process really does allow that to build up from the bottom up uh, and take account some, some of those rural challenges. So our experience at that level has been that partners are very willing to look at that process. Carol might want to comment about her own I think that's quite a full answer, and, and, and I'm just conscious okay. there's a lot of questions in here, and uh, I think Gail wants to do a follow-up and, and, and then another question, so maybe we could get that in. And, 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 and yeah, it's just about the, the community planning partnership. Um, one of their main aims is to reduce inequality. I just wondered how um, HI feeds into that in a rural context. So that's about a number of things in terms of you know access to to work access to education and uh, services and facilities so our, our part in community planning is clearly about the economic strand of activity but in uh, supporting the economic strand of activity and dealing with challenges to employment and particularly wage levels and um, opportunity within the employment Base, particularly within some of those more rural communities, is actually about improving equality overall. Do you want to do the Brexit one? Yeah. Um, we spoke about um, fragility right at the start, and uh, I guess the issue of Brexit is uh, a hot topic at the moment. Um, what conversations have you been having with businesses in the Highlands and Islands about Brexit? And I guess possible impacts, how could you possibly help them to prepare for them? Carol, are you... Okay. <clears throat> One of the, well, our account managers talk to businesses, their account managed businesses on a on a day-to-day -day basis. We also have a business panel, which I run, which um, has a thousand um, organisations across the Highlands and Islands, which we, we survey on a regular basis to get their feedback on specific issues. And recent surveys, we have been asking them about their feelings around Brexit and what impact that has. Now, there's a mixed picture. There have been some positive aspects. For example, the tourism sector in the Highlands and Islands has had a bit of a boost um, with more visitors coming to the area. Food and drink, on the other hand, has been slightly less positive. You know, the price of um, worried about um, exports, particularly to the EU, which is a major market for them. I think at the moment there is uncertainty. People don't really know what, what's going to happen. So maybe being a little bit slower to make some of the investment decisions that they may be, may be planned. There are concerns over access to labour market and the free movement of labour, particularly again in some of the key sectors in rural areas like tourism and food and drink, which do have quite a high proportion of, of workers from overseas. So we have that day-to-day -day communication as an ongoing part of our community, um, our account management process, but we also have this regular surveying where we ask people to update us on, on what their plans are. 
In terms of what we can do to help them, we've run a, a number of seminars with colleagues about potential new export markets, about how to deal with import substitution. You know, for example, um, businesses looking to, to market their, their goods and services more locally as opposed to, to further afield, you know, maybe other parts of the UK, for example. So we can, we can take quite practical measures like that. And I think on the, on the labour market side, it's working with colleagues to try and ensure that in the, the medium term, we can actually make opportunities in these sectors more attractive um, to indigenous labour forces, but also build up the skills locally to take on those jobs. The funding side of things, because the Highlands has traditionally benefited from quite a lot of European funding over the years. Yeah, I think one of the, the things there, obviously that, that is, is an aspect that does concern people. We have been a transition region, so the, the, the volume and the value of European funding come in, coming into the area has been declining, albeit still very important to, to specific projects. I suppose there are some areas that, that um, have, have more concern than others. For example, the higher education sector, which again, in terms of students from overseas, there's, there's quite an impact there. What we've been doing on that basis is working on a number of transnational cooperation projects where you don't necessarily have to be a member of the U U EU, but you can partner with um, other countries and benefit from some of those funding streams. So we're looking at one, other sources of funding to replace EU funds, and secondly, how we can continue to tap into some of those in the future landscape. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Peter, next question. Thank you, and uh, good morning, folks. I suppose it, it falls on a wee bit from, from the Brexit talks, but within, in your introduction, you said that one of your high-level measures was uh, to support exporters. Um, so how many more new exporters are there in the high area since last year, and how does high support increased export activity? A, a number of programmes to support that international activity and, how, uh, and actually are using some EU funds as part of that as a, a programme to really focus on bringing in uh, new exporters. So that's, uh, and we've devised um, a measurement system which we call the internationalisation ladder so that we can track progress of internationalising businesses from those very early stages of starting to think about exporting. Uh, and you may start that by perhaps going first to an exhibition overseas just to see how that works, start making contact to build right through to maybe having a presence overseas and being uh, fully integrated into an internationalizing agenda uh, and relying quite considerably for your income and your turnover through internationalization. And we have found that that has made a significant difference and a if Carol's maybe got a number <laughs> handy. I'm trying to find a, an exact number. We can supply that. Whether I'm going to manage to find it in the next two minutes, I'm not sure. But we, we can certainly give you that, into, as we have been tracking that, to, uh, because I absolutely agree that the, the key here is to get more value, and the more value does tend to come out of a smaller number of businesses, but also to grow the base of uh, internationalising businesses by bringing in new entrants. That is a slow process and can take up to five years from starting to think about it to actually fully exporting. Mm. Well, I mean, if you can find a figure in the, in the, in the meantime, that would be, that'd be useful. Uh, and just to move on, uh, food and drinks obviously a very important part of your work. I see by the graph that's the second most important area as, as far as accounts managed is concerned after others. Um, and that doesn't surprise me, but can you, again, a, a fairly specific question, can you provide detail of High's food and drink collaboration initiative for small scale food producers? Yes, so um, I, I think the one you're referring to um, is some work we did jointly with uh, SDI um, to bring together smaller operators within the food and drink sector, uh, principally to uh, again tackle the issue of exporting. It's a real challenge for a small business, and of course a lot of the business base in the Highlands and Islands is small, and producers can be very small within that, and found that by collaborating, working together, and actually the, the additional support that we put in was somebody who really led that process on behalf of the collaborative group, went into market, 
and made those contacts and really acted um, in, as the agent really supporting that made a big difference. And indeed, we are looking at how we can take that model and roll that out further, uh, not only to other parts of the region, but also in um, other activities, as we have also found that there is um, a sort of synergy across provenance products. So. Uh, people are interested not just in food and drink and its high provenance from the Highlands and Islands, but um, uh, other uh, products, be it textiles like Harris Tweed or others, into a sort of basket of products together. As far as food and drink is concerned, is, is, I would just like a feel for, is it, ma is it mainly fishing products or, or farming products? It will be a bit of both, I suspect, but I, I suspect it's mostly fishing fishing. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so let me try and give you a flavour of that. So, um, uh, farmed salmon is uh, the UK's biggest food export and uh, by f that is produced in the Highlands and Islands so that is most significant overall so that does play a big part as does shellfish it's it's much smaller obviously than particularly uh, farmed salmon but there are a range of other products so quite a lot around bakery products so there are some big producers in the Highlands and Islands like Walkers for example but a number of uh, smaller companies, such as Reeds of Caithness, who've been massively successful and award-winning uh, recently in, in their products. So we're finding that some, there's a lot of traction with niche products in, in bringing those together. So, yep, yeah, salmon does dominate in terms of both volume and value, but there um, is a lot of activity across smaller niche producers. I should also mention uh, the growth in the distilling sector with niche whiskey, a lot of them doing gin in the short term, and microbreweries also been really successful. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, Jamie, I think you've got a quick follow up on that. Good morning, panel. Uh, just on, and to follow that up, uh, so you, you, you talk about your uh, relationship um, uh, regarding exports. Um, can you just explain to me how you work specifically with um, SDI uh, agencies and uh, DIT as well, which obviously have quite strong large overseas networks to help uh, businesses across uh, the country uh, export to the wider world, not just to Europe? I mean, SDI really uh, operates as a, a, an entity which is um, jointly owned, if you like, through Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise and uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. So it is very much part and parcel of the way that we operate in international trade. We do have um, two or three members of staff who are based in the Highlands and Islands who are part of SDI uh, and they uh, host a number of exhibitions and meet the buyer events and are very much part of our programme of supporting uh, increasing international trade. We use their network of overseas office, 22 overseas offices, in terms of our inward investment priorities uh, and also to make contact with any of our businesses which are headquartered overseas as well. So they're very much part of our team and we see ourselves very much part of their team too. Um, the wider relationship with DIT tends to go through SDI as the gateway into that. Um, an example where that worked really well, I would say, was um, the development of what is now CS Wind and Macrahanish in Argyll, in that uh, we found that UKTI, as it was then, uh, SDI and ourselves worked really well together to make sure that what is now the Korean investor came into uh, Argyll to take over that facility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Richard. Um, Audit Scotland informs us that uh, high spending has decreased by 22% in real terms since 2008-2009. How does High respond to Audit Scotland's concern that budget reductions over the last seven years creates a, a risk where the, that those enterprise bodies' resources are being spread over too broad a range of activities and this might not be the, the most efficient way of using their funding and expertise? Yes, uh, thanks. So I think the Audit Scotland was a, uh, report was a really important piece of work and it was good to say, see that on the whole um, it found that the work that both ourselves and Scottish Enterprise was doing uh, was overall very successful. It's always a challenge, I guess, within the, the public sector to look at the uh, issue of budgets and what we see in relation to both opportunity and challenge uh, for 
how we can use our resource. And so particularly to follow up on those points that were raised by uh, Audit Scotland, we have sharpened the approach that we did already have in terms of a resource prioritisation framework that we use. So that's part of a, a tool that we use internally for our decision-making process about where we allocate resource. Uh, we have um, an investment strategy tool for our um, account managers and those supporting businesses to use so that they can ensure that they are making the best decision on whether to use high resources or to use our influence to support other investment or as a package to make that uh, an investment work overall. Uh, and we're also looking at uh, our own forward plans of our strategic investment at our own hand as really we split what we do between our support direct to businesses and communities and things that we do at our own hand, which might be the, the more significant infrastructure projects and use that to flex our use of budget across the piece. Of course, we are, we're now, um, we'll look forward to how things will operate under, uh, along with our partners through the new strategic board and look at how that contributes to the priorities of Scotland overall. But as I said in my introduction, our guiding document is of course Scotland's economic strategy in terms of that priority setting. Just a small follow-up in regard to that. that to I notice in your um, uh, balance sheet, including business receipts, um, in 2008-09, you're 10.6 million. In 2015-16, you're 43 million. You've nearly quadrupled. What is that? Receipts. Um, that you, uh, look at the actual detail for you if you'd like me to come back, but that tends to come uh, from a number of sources. But what can make the most significant difference is what property sales we have during a year so that we will always factor into our budget an amount of property sales. Uh, we have done a, a fair amount of that over recent years and that is probably tailing off for us just now. It makes sense in terms of uh, we've sold some things so it means our portfolio is smaller than it has been previously. Okay. All right. What proportion of high investment over the past few years has been in the Inverness area and has this been to the, the expense of more rural areas? such as Western Isles and Sutherland? Uh, so, if, if you want precise figures, I, I maybe need to come back to you on that, Mr. Lyle, but I, what I can um, point out is that we do ensure that we make investments across the whole of the Highlands and Islands. So, yes, we have had a significant investment in the centre of Inverness through the development of the Inverness campus. However, our approach to that is that that is not just about serving the city of Inverness and by it being a location for both business and the University of the Highlands and Islands, it actually does have a broader reach. But I would, to give some examples, I would set that against uh, our investment in the Western Isles over recent years. In total, we have spent um, nearing uh, 25 million in developments at Arnish near Stornoway. Uh, we contributed £5 million to the £10 million development of uh, Lock Boysdale Harbour as part of the uh, community developments there. Uh, we contributed a million pounds to the development of the fantastic uh, facility which is Lewes Castle in Stornoway. So we, I think our record stands for itself in terms of making sure that those investments are spread throughout the Highlands and Islands and that is important to us. Sure that everyone gets a share of the cake. Well, uh, I, I think I said in my introduction that it is important that we drive growth throughout the whole of the Highlands and Islands. So that doesn't mean that every, every year that split looks the same, but takes advantage of whatever the opportunities or challenges might be at any one time in other parts of the area. And the benefit of that regional approach is the ability to switch that depending on what has happened or, or what those opportunities are. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Jamie. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about your finances, um, looking at your 2016-2017 spending budget, which I believe is around £80 million. Pounds. Could you uh, advise me how much of that uh, will be specifically spent on either loans to businesses, grant funding, or uh, via taking an equitable stake in any businesses in, in the high area? Uh, yes, I can, but I haven't got that split in front of me, I'm afraid, but I, I can certainly come back to you. Okay, um, and uh, looking backwards, perhaps, could you uh, advise me of any particular success stories or any uh, major losses or investment write-offs that you think the committee should be aware of 
as part of those loan or, or grant schemes? Yes, so um, in, in terms of some of the uh, recent successes, um, let's look at a few examples. So we are working at the moment with um, an early stage life sciences company in Dingwall, uh, Inside Biometrics Limited. Uh, they actually um, were developed with uh, the principal was formerly working at LifeScan, uh, Scotland, Johnson & Johnson, um, the Scotland's biggest life sciences company. He left the company when they made some downsizing, but has set up this uh, new company inside Biometrics in Dingwall, who we've made a number of investments in. We have recently given them an award of R&D funding, uh, and they have grown tremendously and are attacking a, a really important niche in relation to both uh, diabetes and ketone monitoring. And I've also found that what they're doing um, is useful for people who want to uh, be able to track their metabolic rate when exercising so they can determine what is best for them. So these types of investment in early stage companies do carry a degree of risk. Uh, this one so far has been on a very successful course. We have had some in that space um, in the Argyle area which have not been so successful. And for us that is the balance of risk that is important. Without making those judgments and decisions to follow through on that, we won't get the kind of growth that ultimately led to a small company um, in Vanessa Medical turning into a, a corporate uh, and impressive a significant uh, employer in Inverness, which is now uh, LifeScan. So could you, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get a feel for the sense of uh, the ROI that, that, that you're getting from these investments. I'm not, I'm, it's not quite clear either on, on paper or on your evidence if the, it's heading in a more positive direction or are there more losses than gains. So I wonder if perhaps following this up, you could write to us with details of some of the financials behind uh, what investments you've made, which ones have been successful or not successful, and therefore the relevant uh, returns. I'm certainly happy to give you some detail on that uh, so that you get the split of that. But I mean, overall, there are absolutely, the impact overall of our investment is much more success than loss. I think the message I just wanted to get across there is that a degree of loss, I think, is expected because we are taking risks and that's the business that we are in. Thank you. Short question following on that on the budget um, the in the last financial year. I notice your operating costs are just over 18% of your uh, spending plans uh, last year. And the budget has been reduced over the last few years. Could you tell me what proportion um, is it? Has it reduced your your operating costs, or are you still at the same level of about 18%? Or what what's the trend since your budget has gone down? What about your operating costs? Are they still operating about 18% or have you reduced them? So some things have reduced. So um, a, a key one is our uh, headquarters. Um, we were in a building which we leased. Uh, we moved out of that to allow an inward investor to move in. We have now uh, built our own building on land that we own. So that actually has made a significant saving in itself. And we are rationalising our office space across, across the whole of the Highlands and Islands. However, it is really important to us that we retain local offices and we'll always make sure that we do that. There's just a point also I'd just like to make about the operating costs in terms of the staff resource, because whilst um, the comparison you make is very valid in terms of the cost of operation and the amount of money that we disperse to businesses and others, a lot of what we provide is actually advice and that comes from the people that we employ as well. So whilst they're also part of the operating costs, they are delivering direct to business also. But I was just trying to get a grip of whether they've stayed the same or they've, as a proportion of whether they've increased or decreased. So, I mean, we, for the budget for this current year that we're in, we have increased that slightly, but that reflects the picture that I've just painted to you of moving more towards ensuring that advice and information through expertise in our staff base is a key part of our product. Okay, next question, Rhoda. Thank you. Um, looking at High's operating plan, what progress has been made in the last year towards achieving the goals set out? Okay. So, just give you a flavour of some of that. So, in relation to uh, the, the year just entered March, uh, so um, I think I mentioned in my introduction, uh, that's almost uh, 1,700 uh, 
jobs created and retained. That's significantly higher than the measure range that we set of 700 to 900 job and the jobs. And there were some significant outliers in that in uh, terms of big investments with some of our inward investors. So we tend to um, sometimes look at those as outliers within that overall picture. But that was a very significant outturn in terms of the job numbers for that year. Um, we measure the impact of what we do with business in terms of business turnover. Uh, and the, the view we take there is what their turnover will have incre increased by just attributed to our intervention uh, by year three of their development plans. And for that, it is uh, 120 million of forecast of increased turnover, of which almost 80 million would come from international sales. Again, showing that focus in terms of the, the push on international sales. I mentioned the 12 inward investment um, projects, uh, 47 communities that were account managing and supporting. Uh, turnover from the social economy, as you know that what we do with social enterprise and the social economy is really important to us. Turnover growth of uh, 5.6 million. Um, in terms of uh, uh, access to uh, fibre broadband, uh, that's uh, 155 premises with access. Uh, wave Energy Scotland, which is our subsidiary company uh, dealing with technology development in Wave Energy, uh, dispersed six and a half million towards 16 projects. Uh, and our um, Digital Excellence Centre, Hello Digital, saw over 2,000 people come to a variety of uh, events to uh, progress what we want to do in terms of digital. So getting the fibre in place is great, but it's also about the benefits realisation of that. Um, and that uh, 2,000 people were at a variety of events, including drones, uh, virtual reality, um, 3D making, and a whole range of things there. Sorry, Carol. I think this, <clears throat> those, are, those are the, the progress are kind of against our harder measures. I think there are a range of, of other things which are slightly um, less, <clears throat> well, more difficult to measure prob probably, but things like um, support to, to HIAL to attract more international flights into Inverness Airport, which has a, a huge impact on the region with, you know, KLM just announced the other day a second daily flight from Inverness to Amsterdam. And the feedback that we've had from the business community and potential investors on those, that increased and improved connectivity has been really, really good. Um, High undertook a piece of research recently with young people in the region about what they felt about the region and their attitudes and aspiration. And again, we're seeing a much more increased positivity amongst young people about their prospects within the region, about the fact that they want to, to live and work and study in the Highlands and Islands. And they're saying it's a much more attractive place to, to live now than it was five years ago. And looking five years forward, they think it will be even, even more improved then. So I think some of these trends that we look at are becoming more positive now. It's not always easy to say how much of that is directly attributable to what, what I have done, but we're certainly um, contributing towards a lot of those improvements. Okay. Are you, if, are you going to move on to the next question? Because there is a sort of follow-up question to that that Gail would like to ask, or, or, or do you have a follow-up to that specific I one? I just had a follow-up to that Please, specific, yeah. if I can, and then I'll move on to the next well, one. Well, if you can pause <coughs> and let Gail come in after your follow-up. So. Okay. Um, just that sounds very positive. Do you foresee challenges in meeting your... For this, for the targets for this year? Yes. Uh, well, one of, uh, as Carol mentioned, in terms of what our business panel was saying, that potentially there is a slowdown in businesses making investment decisions. So I think that will continue to be an area of focus for, for us and how we use, uh, you know, our investment powers as a leverage there. Uncertainty always means that businesses just perhaps feel that um, a little bit less confident about making some of those decisions to develop. We want to make sure that we can continue to find the right uh, strategy and the right support for businesses to continue to grow. Carol, if I bring you in, then I'll come yeah, back to you for a moment. Thanks, right Convener. Just really quickly, you talk about 1,700 jobs created and retained, and I'd imagine it's relatively straightforward to calculate the amount of new jobs that are being created. But how do you calculate jobs being retained? And what does that mean? 
So that's if there's a, a threat to a business uh, and we're investing uh, to support that development. What we need to look at is what would happen if we didn't make that investment and in some cases the business would retract so that if that investment means that they maintain that workforce and sometimes it's a mix of there's a, an element that they maintain and an additional number of new jobs that they would grow. So um, we do look really carefully at that. To, uh, and in some cases, it's quite small numbers, but in some um, perhaps more high profile cases where there has been a total threat to a business and we have stepped in, then we, we may be able to say that the intervention through the public sector has really supported maintaining the whole of that facility. Okay, so right up, back to you. Um, Audit Scotland had said that yourself, Scottish Enterprise and the Scottish Government had to do more to make sure that your performance framework um, aligned with the, the national performance framework. What work has been carried out and do you think it aligns well now? I think there's quite a lot of work ongoing <clears throat> as part of the Enterprise and Skills Review and our staff have been working very closely with in particular Scottish Government and Scottish Enterprise but other, other public sector bodies as well to ensure that we are more more aligned and that we are measuring the, th the same things in the same way so it is work in progress but I think you know we've done some work in internally to say how our measures align to the national performance framework but on a broader basis yes we are working with them to improve that and I think um, a new measurement framework is in development uh, if I maybe just add as well I think moving forward with that, we do think it is quite important that some of the things that we measure because of the activities that we undertake, we would continue to do so because we, we do have that additional remit with what we do with communities and the social enterprise sector. And we'd still want to make sure that we were tracking and measuring that in terms of our investment and also the impact that that makes to our communities. Do you think it would be helpful that the national performance framework would adopt some of those? Because certainly I hear from people in other areas that, that they're quite envious about some of the social remit that High has, and especially in areas of deprivation and areas with issues about rurality, people are keen to have that social dimension. Do you see that being adopted? Certainly discussing that as part of, as, as one of the work streams through the uh, Enterprise and Skills Review is on uh, data. So we're uh, supporting that and hopefully influencing where that might go. I mean, we recognise in that picture that um, we are a regional agency and there are a number of national indicators, which of course we would contribute to. Okay, thank you. The, the next question is John Finney. Good morning, panel. Can I thank you for the good work you do across the area? Um, um, it's, it's not always recognised, but it, it is appreciated, I assure you. I'd like to ask about social enterprises. Um, Highlands and Islands is 9% of the population, but I'm told 22% of the social enterprises and 193 are your managed accounts. That's 30% of all our accounts. C can you give some detail of the specific support that's provided, please? Yep, I'll, I'll start with that one. Yeah, you, you, I think you're correct in your numbers. 22% um, of Scotland's social enterprises in the Highlands and Islands, according to the 2015 census, of which we were behind. Um, we account manage so about around 150 social enterprises per se. The other 47 or so are as, as our community account management, which is a kind of broader based, more holistic uh, support to primarily our more fragile communities. The support we offer. Um, to our social enterprise is actually very similar to the types of support we offer uh, to our business base. Um, it's a range of um, interventions from advice uh, to financial support to access to a broad range of services, um, from uh, graduate placements to you know, whatever. So it, it covers the broad range and it's, it's really that intense account management support that makes the difference and it's what's appropriate for the plans and aspirations of that, of that social enterprise. The portfolio covers quite a broad range um, from um, organisations that um, support those furthest away from the labour market. Uh, you might have seen in the media uh, today um, our investment uh, towards Cope Limited in Shetland um, to diversify and expand its operation. It's similarly as an organisation in, in 
in Campbelltown at the opposite end of the region, Kintai Recycling, that, that, that does similar work. So there's a broad range um, geographically and also sectorally. We've got a number of clients in the childcare sector um, and we support them uh, equally in a, in a number of ways. So it's, a, it's a broad range of specific support to the organisations and the ones we work with are those that can deliver the greatest impact economically or socially. Thank you very much. Can, can I ask about uh, another two, two initiatives, and that is the Scottish Business Pledge and the Living Wage. Are you able to say how many of your uh, account uh, managed companies are signed up for that? And do you have a target for the current or indeed future years at all, please? I, from, from memory, and I will have to confirm this figure, I think it's around about 10 or 12 of our account managed businesses are signed up. Um, so proportionately across the country, it's kind of even, but a, a relatively low figure at the moment. What we do do is, again, this, the business pledge is being promoted very heavily by account managers to our, our client businesses, but sign-up currently is, is relatively low. But I think I would add that um, I, um, this is, I suppose, the approach we've taken with account managed businesses. A high proportion of them are actually meeting all of the elements of the Scottish Business Pledge. So I think it's just getting them to go through that final stage of that in signing up for it. So the majority of them do meet the criteria within the Scottish Business Pledge, quite a lot of them. OK, thank you. Can I finally just ask a question? The term alignment's been used, and I, I was to understand uh, your relationship with other bodies, particularly the Scottish Government, uh, with regard to sp two specific issues, one of which I've discussed personally with you, Joanna, and that is the issue of ethical investment. And the other is a very specific issue, and that is the concerns expressed about the Geopark in North West Sutherland, an uh, institution of world significance which requires a modest sum. Are you able to comment on your relationship with the Scottish Government and other bodies regarding these two issues, please? In terms of those <coughs> specifics, and um, I mean, we have had a conversation about the uh, question of ethical investment, and I have talked to Scottish Government about that as we uh, discussed. It's not a straightforward one to answer in terms of what exactly we are meaning by ethical investments. And I think the particular point that we discussed previously was round about uh, those involved in arms. Uh, and we did just highlight some of the activities of some of our engineering companies, which may feed in at some point perhaps into that supply chain, but are not, we don't directly support any that are manufacturing weapons as such. But uh, Is that a, a conscious policy? Well, we, we don't actually have a, a policy set per se, no. Perhaps it's something you could look at. But no, I, I mean, I understand your concerns about that, and we will continue to have those conversations uh, with our partners in Scottish Government to see where that takes us in terms of a policy approach. In relation to the Geopark, I know that um, our local office in Thurso is uh, looking at the challenges for that particular Geopark. We have other Geopark areas within Highlands and Islands as well, and hopefully we can find a resolution, because you know, I understand that they do are doing a lot of good work, and if there's a way that we can continue to support them and find a sustainable route for them for the future, that is the important thing with any of these types of initiatives, is actually finding the route to sustainability. Okay, many thanks indeed. Well, do, well done on getting that uh, uh, constituency or regional question directly in, Mr Finney. Uh, John Mason, uh, yours is the next question. Great. Thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, Rhoda Grant already mentioned the social dimension that you have, which is slightly different from Scottish enterprise, so I wanted to explore that a little bit. Um, th this whole community support model that HIE has... Um, I mean, if we're going to have a new body in the south of Scotland, would that be something you think they would benefit from? And in fact, part of me wonders, should the whole of Scotland and Scottish Enterprise have this as well? Or is there something unique about the Highlands and Islands, which I agree there is, a, that requires it there that doesn't require it elsewhere? So thanks for that. Um, I mean, on your last point, I, th I think I would always say there is something unique about the Highlands and Islands. There are other predominantly rural parts of Scotland who sh might share some of the same challenges and opportunities, but Highlands and Islands is half of the landmass of Scotland with uh, significant challenges of our islands and uh, sparsity of population. 
In relation to the proposed vehicle for um, south of Scotland, we are engaged with the, uh, the group that are looking at that. We have hosted visited visits from the South of Scotland Alliance so that they can see more of what we've been doing in the Highlands and Islands and, and see what's transferable. Uh, and we're really keen just to ensure that the experience, skills, knowledge and expertise of Highlands and Islands is put into the mix there to support the development of what is most appropriate to deal with uh, the opportunities for South of Scotland. Mm. I, mean, I mean, do you see it as a significant difference from the way Scottish Enterprise look at uh, communities, the, the way you're dealing with them? Well, it is, and that some of the things that Douglas described earlier about our approach to community account management, where we account manage whole communities, where we have uh, worked to support uh, those with income generating assets. Uh, we run the Scottish Land Fund across the whole of Scotland in partnership with the Big Lottery, which reflects, I suppose, the the expertise, the knowledge, and indeed the policy, which has part, been part of Highlands and Islands, which is actually about where land sits for communities as well. I mean, I mean, communities is a challenge all over Scotland, and I accept there are slightly different challenges, but I, I would suggest that some of the communities in the cities are also struggling with their identity and so on. Um, I mean, do you think there is anything that Scottish Enterprise or we could roll out more widely in the urban areas as well from, from what you've learned? But I think there's always opportunities to, to share that knowledge. I suppose the way we have worked has been specifically about our communities in our more rural areas. The degree to which that might transfer might look slightly different in terms of some of those challenges. Uh, often, um, so our, our challenges are, are about uh, access to facilities and resources. I think the challenges in relation to urban centres, of which we have few really, tend to be more about the indicators of deprivation that we spoke about earlier in terms of higher unemployment or um, lack of access to employment. So I suppose our last point would just be then, I mean, where does, Inver Inverness has been mentioned already, but where does it fit into all this? Because it's now a city, which it didn't used to be. It seems to be doing quite well. Um, does it not need that kind of level of input as a uh, more rural areas would need? So I mean, Inverness is a tremendous success story, and I, I think the parallel has often been used, and you've probably heard it here as well, between uh, the story of Inverness and the story of Dumfries as a comparator of different parts of the country. Uh, we see what has happened in Inverness to have uh, an effect across uh, other parts of the Highlands and Islands, so that it is a driver of the economy. We don't claim that it drives the whole of the Highlands and Islands economy. There are a number of small economies throughout such a, a, a diverse area. What we need to do and are doing in Inverness is focus on the key opportunities. So investing in the business base and really creating a very dynamic city environment there. And we're working with Highland Council and the uh, delivery of the Inverness city region deal. And importantly, it is a city region deal. It's not just about the centre of Inverness, but again, how we use that to push out to the other parts, particularly of Highland area. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, your, yours is the next question. We often hear uh, uh, much said about the demographic and population challenges that face the Highlands and Islands. I was therefore quite surprised to see that actually it performs quite well in terms of population growth. The Highland uh, population growth has doubled the, the Scottish average, um, with the exception of Argyll and Butte, where the population has shrunk. Um, do you have any views on, on those uh, uh, potential challenges over the next, say, 5, 10, 15 years? Um, both demographic and population specific? I, th I think you're absolutely right. The population story overall has, has been positive and, and growing apart from in Argyll where I think there are some specific challenges. I think we see the demographic issue as a bigger one and that's about that missing gap in the middle of, of the younger element of the population. We do have an, an, uh, an aging population in most areas and that's where we see you know, attracting young people back to the region or encouraging them to stay in the region as being key to the, the growth of the region. It does vary across the, the patch. And, and as I was saying to you earlier, the, the research that we've done recently into, into um, attitudes and aspirations of young people has helped to, helped to inform some of our work. I mean, I don't think any of the, the outcomes of that have been a particular surprise. You know, people want, young people want access to 
employment opportunities, they want access to really good um, education opportunities, and our work with the UHI has really helped to ensure that young people can stay and learn and study in their own home areas rather than necessarily move away. But I think the, the tackling the demographic issue is a key one for High across the region. And it's, it, is, it is going to continue to be a challenge as we move forward. And uh, yep, uh, if, I, if I may move on, uh, I think one of the challenges in uh, encouraging uh, people to come back to there has been the issue of connectivity and digital connectivity. So uh, I wonder if we might just reflect quickly on that. Um, could you um, advise me if you uh, will be participating in the remainder of the R100 project? Absolutely. I mean, as you're obviously aware, High have led on the phase one of the NGB rollout in the Highlands and Islands, which um, has, has been a, a really challenging project. But I think, you know, be, um, High have been involved in, in connectivity telecoms projects for a long time now, going back a number of years. Um, we've, we've got a really good story to tell, and I know it's not good enough and it's not fast enough um, for those people that it hasn't touched yet. But we are an integral part of R100. We're working very closely with Scottish Government colleagues in terms of, of the shape of that and how it rolls out. I think we've learned a huge amount from the, the phase one rollout. We always knew it was going to be very challenging in the Highlands and Islands and quite different from the rest of Scotland. And I think the, the thing that we all do have to remember is that although by the end of the, the current contract, the phase one, um, we will have touched 86% of premises across the region, which is slightly in excess of, of where we had hoped to be when we first started out, which was 84%. We have achieved a, a better result than that. But that remaining 14% is absolutely the most challenging bit. So it's, it's not a, a, a case of being complacent or think that the job's nearly done. There still is a, a difficult job to do, and it's absolutely vital. We feel that High are, are part of that going forward. And certainly our colleagues within Scottish Government have indicated that they're very, very keen for us to, to be an integral part of that. So uh, you mentioned getting to this last 14%, which I think we, we all accept would be the, is, is the most challenging part of the country to get to in the, the furthest away, away parts of, of Scotland. Um, we've had previously had um, evidence that suggests that it may cost as much to get um, high-speed connectivity to those areas as it would for the rest of Scotland in, in its entirety. Do you have any views on that? Um, I think there are probably better informed people have given evidence to you in the past, but I certainly would agree that you know the, the bits that we've got left to do are going to cost a significant amount of money. I think until we do detailed modelling, we won't, we won't be absolutely sure. But I think the ballpark figures that you have been given, I, w I wouldn't disagree with them. Sorry, can I, can, can I just clarify, Carol, just so I can understand? We've been given three different sets of ballpark figures that v vary between, as far as I can understand, 100 million and 600 million. <clears throat> Which ballpark figures would you not disagree with? Well, I think my, Without my, being, taking you too far from being your very diplomatic <laughs> self that you are. I think my colleague Stuart Robertson gave evidence at a previous committee where he said it was in the region of maybe about 300. 300, okay. Okay, so somewhere in the middle. Uh, very, very, very diplomatic. That, sorry, I, Jamie, could, did you want to? Yeah, sorry, could sorry. I just be very cheeky and take the opportunity to correct my question that I gave to Mr Finney, I can update the figures on the business pledge. We had 12 account managed companies, that's now risen to 17. Across the Highlands and Islands there are 25, so that's including companies that High don't um, support. That's very positive, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jamie, did you have a follow up question Finally, before we yes. move on to Rhoda? So I, I'm, I am pleased to hear that there's a, a sort of creative or tech hubs developing in, in the high area, I think that's very exciting. Um, but with technology, obviously, become, comes other risks, such as automation industry, um, or even technological advances in rural, rural agriculture industries. Do you see any, uh, any challenges or risks specifically around uh, uh, the digital economy, technology, uh, posing any risks to the progress of high, or do you see it more as opportunities? Definitely, in terms more as opportunity, um, I, mean, I think we're all aware of the productivity challenge that there is for Scotland. Um, as ever with these types of numbers, that productivity gap looks bigger for the Highlands and Islands, which reflects you know, the business base in itself. So opportunities for 
automation or use of technology are absolutely what we are doing with companies. Um, a, a great example will be what we can do with uh, Liberty, who are the new owners of the aluminium smelter in Fort William, who are not only protecting the, um, the actual production of the primary product, but are planning um, some downstream manufacturing. So this is a significant uh, step in terms of industrial manufacturing for the Highlands and Islands and an opportunity to get that state of the art from day one. So that's an easy example when you're looking at a big manufacturing process, I guess. So on a smaller scale, we look at that in relation to our food and drink industry, because that's all about production and how that can be improved and speeded up. And there are some great examples out there of how innovation has made a difference to some of the smaller scale businesses too. Thank you. Uh, just before we move on, Carol, can I take you back to a comment uh, that you just made? You said that when further detailed modeling was undertaken, uh, in relation to the final 14% that, that you haven't managed to, or we haven't managed to get to. When, when are you planning that detailed modelling and when will the results be known? Well, I think the, the procurement process for, for R100 will be kicking off this year with contract awards sometimes ne sometime next year. So some of the modelling will start at that stage. But a lot will be done once people, the engineers, are actually on the ground delivering. And that's what we found during the course of this contract that you know you, you can um, estimate to a certain degree during the procurement pro process and on, on information that's currently available. But sometimes when you get out there on the ground, things aren't always necessarily as, as you thought they were. Uh, no, no I'm, I'm just asking because one of the questions that I think we all probably get asked is, is when people are going to get their broadband and especially in relation to HIE projects and, and, and businesses across the Highlands, it becomes fairly critical. Build in our area, although the, um, the phase one contract is coming to an end and the main part of the contract actually concluded back in December time, the extended build and the, the spend on um, base funded by the Innovation Fund and the gain share payment, which is what BT put back in because of the, the take up, will extend out to December um, well, probably into next year, actually, 2018. So build will continue in our area over the next 18 months, and then the, the R100 build will kick off after that. So we will be able to update communities through the normal process, the, the exchanges on the website, of when, when they will be coming into the programme. OK, Breda, I think you've got the next question. The Islands region has enjoyed quite high employment rates compared to the rest of Scotland, but I think we all know that some of that is made up by multiple jobs, low paid, seasonal working. How much of that is actually the case? And how do you see, well, what would you see as being ways of tackling that? Because obviously tourism is a big part of the Highland economy. I think in terms of employment rates, you're, you're absolutely right. Again, the Highlands and Islands has higher, historically higher levels of employment than, than the rest of Scotland. Similarly with unemployment, it's, it's lower levels, although that can vary quite a bit across the region. I think you know, we, we do have low paid sectors and some of the major sectors are histori historically reasonably low paid. I think part of our remit and part of the work that we do with businesses through our account management is to drive up wage levels in businesses we support. And if when we look at, at um, for example, last year, the profile of salary levels in businesses that we supported, I think there is a good, pic a good story to tell and a good picture to show. Um, I think that's really how we, we do it, by supporting businesses to grow and helping them to increase wage levels individually. I, I think I think your point about um, people with an, a number of jobs is absolutely a picture that we recognise, but it's, it's actually really difficult to be able to get the true data on it. So um, I, I can think of numerous examples, you know, real examples where we do know that that is happening. Uh, I guess that says something about the employment opportunities and particularly where that's affected by seasonality or, as Carol says, the, the issue of the predominance of some low pay sectors. So trying to get to the bottom of that is quite challenging, but I think we have enough anecdotal evidence from our own knowledge of the communities that we live and work in to know that there is something that's happening there. In some ways, it's a good thing because it's about 
the resilience in communities and that they ensure that between in a community that all of the key things are getting done and services are pick, getting picked up. But that is a challenge for an individual to actually manage that kind of juggling of two or three jobs. Absolutely recognise that. Okay, um, just moving on to, to a different question and one that has kind of come up today to an extent about Inverness and its growth and whether that is at the detriment of the rest of the region. Um, I wonder if you looked at that, I mean, how much does Inverness, I suppose, attract businesses from the rest of the region, people from the rest of the region, so it becomes almost a magnet pulling some of the, I suppose, the things that you need in communities into the centre rather than encouraging spread out into the periphery? I guess generally there's always going to be an attractiveness about what the biggest town, the city in the Highlands and Islands can offer, whether it's about business or indeed social and amenity. So a lot of people use Inverness for actually that service base. But what we and our partners, and I think you know, UHI is an, an important example of this, have recognised is that we have a distributed way of operating and you know, there is nothing like the University of the Highlands and Islands anywhere else, really, in the way that the, the colleges operate both across FE and HE sectors, so that we've got blended learning opportunities. And not only do we have the colleges, but we've got a network of learning centres throughout the region. I think in the last 10 years, that has made a substantial difference to access to both further and higher education. That in itself is really going to drive up the opportunities. But people can be using Lewes Castle or they can use the North Atlantic Fisheries College to access a full range of academic provision through the UHI. I think that in itself has the ability to be a game changer and is why we've supported UHI, as you know, for the last 20 odd years. And our own approach is really similar, that our area offices are absolutely integral to the way we deliver and making sure that our resource distribution reflects need and opportunity is critical to us. But Inverness is important and having a regional centre is important to the growth of the region. So it's, I suppose it's a bit of a balancing act to get that right. Just, just as supplementary on that, have you done any work to see whether or not Inverness is a block to people leaving the region altogether? To have those facilities in Inverness, maybe would, people would have left and gone to Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, as you know, been historically the case in the Highlands. Having those facilities and that focus in Inverness, has that maybe kept people closer to home and made, them, made it more possible for them to move back home if the opportunities arise? So I think we see some of that evidenced by the youth survey that, that Carol mentioned in that, uh, so we've done that uh, two, twice now with a five year uh, interval in between. And in that time period, there has been a difference in the attitudes of young people. So you know, several years back, the attitude certainly in some parts of our region would be the brightest and best are on the first ferry or train or boat or whatever it is out of there. And that attitude has changed considerably that people are really have a, a commitment to the area, but the uh, ability to have the university access and the job access has started to make a difference that people are starting to see those employment opportunities. We also see with the, the provision now a student accommodation in Inverness, in Fort William and elsewhere is making a difference that students are moving into these areas so that people are coming from elsewhere to uh, follow the adventure tourism degrees in Fort William and staying there and adding to the community. These things actually make a really big difference, but they're slowly building. So I think there's probably, to answer your key point, have we got, we've got some information and research, there's perhaps more that we can do uh, to really uh, understand how those dynamics work and how I suppose we can leverage that to the best for the, the region overall. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Thanks, Mary. Um, last August, uh, it was announced by the Scottish Government that a new island strategic group would be set up and included local authority leaders, chief executives uh, from all the councils that had islands. Um, is HIE involved in that or not? 
right. So we weren't invo we're not involved with that group particularly, mm -hmm. but we have been working through um, our area teams who are based in the island areas on the island's deal, and particularly on the economic strand of that. Could I ask, therefore, <coughs> I know the, 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 the government's going to come forward with an island's bill, and <coughs> could you tell me what you think will be the important elements in it, as far as you're concerned, um, and what, do you, what would you like to have in it, from your perspective? So we made a submission to the consultation on the Islands Bill, uh, and I think in that we're really uh, illustrating the importance of the kind of flexible approach of government policy to ensure that islands and indeed uh, other parts of fragile mainland areas, we have many uh, fragile areas such as remote peninsulas in the highlands and islands that are actually are equally challenged as those that are totally surrounded by water. Plenty of them are surrounded by three sides and by water and have many of the same challenges indeed. So that in, in some ways we see that as a wider issue for those fragile areas to make sure that we have proper access and that policy supports that overall. So we have made some comments along those lines in relation to the Islands Bill. It just surprises me that you've not been involved in the group. Um, and uh, do you think you should have been? We're certainly happy to support that. I mean, I think that <coughs> that decision has really been led by the views of the local authorities that have been involved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Strange. Thank you. Uh, the penultimate question is to Richard, and then I've got a question. Yeah. Um, I, uh, just out of curiosity, I, I, I see a new budget line in your budget, uh, which has never been before, a million pound support for Scottish Government um, initiative. What is that? One million pound this year, never been in your budget before. Support for Scottish Government initiative. What is it? Sorry, I'm not seeing. I think, is, Richard, sorry, is I, that 2015 16? 15 16, sorry. There was £1 million set aside. 15 in 16? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't brought anything on 15 16 with me. Uh, Maybe I, we could like this. Yes. Just take it, curiosity. Yeah, yeah certainly. Sorry. Okay. If there's no further questions, I, I have one which is, uh, if I may, uh, directed to you, Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte, you'll be aware in the uh, of recent vote in the Parliament regarding the HIE board um, and the decision that was made by the Parliament. Can you inform the committee how that decision is being implemented by the Scottish Government in HIE, please? The Scottish Government have confirmed that uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise Board, as we know it and as it currently operates, will continue to do so. So there will be no change to the High Board. Uh, they do intend to progress the new strategic board. Um, that is still underway, uh, so that hasn't met yet or been formed, but the, the chair of each of the agencies, including the chair of High, will be a member of that new strategic board. But in terms of the key point, and I know there was a, a lot of uh, local and other interest in that, is that the High Board absolutely continues with its uh, membership as it currently is and to operate as it currently does. So that's in terms of all of its decision-making powers and autonomy. Uh, uh, sorry, I see, I'm, being, I'm just pushing you a little bit. I see interim before your name on the, on the briefing paper. Does that mean that you, you, are, you are staying or, you, or that hasn't been sorted yet? We're currently, uh, High are currently recruiting for their permanent chief executive. Okay. And that process should be concluded in early June. Okay, thank you very much for enlightening us on that. Are there any other questions at the committee? Uh, Charlotte, was there anything that you think that we have missed very briefly that you'd like to bring to our attention? Uh, I think that's been a, a really wide-ranging conversation. I apologise that we didn't have some of the specific details that some of you have asked for, so we will make sure that we follow up on that. And I'd just like to invite any members of the committee, if there are things that they would like to follow up with us directly, that we're delighted to come and talk to you, or indeed invite any of you to see some of the projects that we've talked about in the Highlands and Islands. Really keen to do that and to get to know you all better. Okay, well, thank you. And I, I know the, uh, the clerks will be in contact with you about the additional information that, that we've requested and you've offered that we can have and we'll circulate that to members. So thank you very much for attending the committee this morning and for giving evidence to us. I'm now briefly going to suspend the meeting to allow the panel to leave. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you. I'd like to re reconvene the meeting and move on to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation. The, we would need to consider four negative instruments as detailed in the agenda. Um, and if anyone wishes to raise any matters reporting, oh, sorry, on reporting these to the Parliament, members should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to these instruments and there have been no representations to the committee on them either. Does any one member of the committee wish to make any comments? No. Is the committee therefore agreed it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to these instruments? Agreed. It is agreed. We will now move on to draft, uh, sorry, the agenda item four, which is consideration of the draft annual report. Uh, the report covers the work of the committee during the parliamentary year between the 12th of May 2016 and the 11th of May 2017. Um, I'd like to uh, consider the report on a page-by-page -page basis um, and see if there are any comments to, to make. Uh, page one. Yes, Stuart. Uh, just a general comment. I passed to the clerk some very minor typographical, which I will not raise in detail. But in paragraph two. Which one? Page two. One. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. Page one. Uh, okay, page two. It's given now. <laughs> we are now one all in the scoring rates. Um, uh, I, uh, this seems that I'm not keeping uh, a at score. Page, at paragraph two, yeah. um, I just wonder if it might be useful to add in, before all meetings are in Edinburgh, held in Edinburgh, the agenda for all meetings, including details of private business, is published on the Parliament's website. It, the purpose of doing that is to make clear that while we do meet in private from time to time, we are making public the matters which we discuss in private, so that therefore we can be held to account for the matters we discuss in private. Okay. Fine. Yep. I'll pass my note. Okay. Anything else on page two? Page three. <laughs> It's quite a few odd uh, well, typographic errors. Pa page, they will all be picked up in the proofreading. Page four. Page five. Paragraph 12. Um, I, I, at the end of the paragraph, it says, uh, due to open in May 2016, six months later than originally planned. I'd like to propose, in line with what the Cabinet Secretary actually said to um, on the 8th of June 2016, that we consider whether we should say um, it was due to open in May 2016 in line with the contractual date, but six months later than previously anticipated. Uh, does anyone on the committee... I, th I think that is a factual representation of, of the situation. Yes. OK, thank you. Anything else on page five? Page six. Page seven. Very nice picture. Yeah, really, uh, <laughs> I, I have to say in a, that really through you convener. <laughs> it's a good picture and we'll move straight on. Th through you convener, I, I have to say it was a, a very enjoyable um, uh, walk through the tunnel. Uh, Mr. Mason and I done going uh, the, on the Queen Street tunnel uh, was a uh, a very exciting project and it was very exciting to actually see it uh, and walk through that tunnel. Page eight. Sorry, page eight. Say something that's later in it, but I'm pretty sure I've double, triple checked. Uh, the, there is um, a lot in here that's very specific around certain transport issues, but I don't, I just, it's just a general comment that I, get the impression that it doesn't give a flavour that we do cover a broad range of transport issues, such as uh, ferries, um, you know, electronic vehicles and, and so on. I, I just feel it very much specifically focuses on the bridge and rail services and very little else. Okay, we, we could uh, certainly add it into the report to make sure that it covers or shows the flavour of all the areas of transport that we're involved with. Yes, John. I wonder then if, if it might be um, helpful to print the committees, the areas of responsibility, maybe at the outset, and that would 
show that, although not specifically, be up yes. within the span. I think that would be a useful suggestion. Thank you. While, while we're under that, if I may yes. just, uh, I couldn't see a section, maybe I'm wrong, on, on, the, on the petitions that we've dealt with. Is it? Where, where, which page is it? Page 11? There is a section. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is, there yeah, is a very so, short section on petitions, yes. It's on page 11. But there's nothing in there to say what we've done with them? We, we can expand that. We can expand that out to... to but it's a link to petitions. I just think it's helpful for the public to know, rather than just listing petitions. Okay. We'll, we'll expand that out to say what we've done with those petitions, yeah. Can we go back to page 8, committee? Page 9... Page 10. Okay. Page 11. Page 12. Um, yes. In relation to that, I, I, I wonder, um, I think the report's very well put together, and I appreciate it's just a very small summary, but with regard to qualities, could we mention perhaps two issues, and that is uh, the, the committee's... Uh, looking at the public transport aspects of uh, um, Queen's Ferry Crossing, because we know that public transport addresses a number of uh, the areas covered by equalities, um, and also specifically the, with regard to the crofting, the entry of young people or the retention of young people. I mean, well, certainly, I, th I, think, I think the point on public transport is an interesting one. I think it would probably fit neater in the Queen's Ferry crossing bit, but we can right. certainly make reference to that. And certainly on crofting, we could make uh, reference to the fact that we were looking at a uh, new entrance in, in the crofting bit as well. I'm advised by the I, clerks, Mr. Finney, uh, that, that, that both of those fall outside technical definition of equalities. We'll fit them in the report in the appropriate place, is what, I, what the clerks have suggested. Yes, no, I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll bow to the, 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 the clerks on that, but simply to say that the purpose of public transport is not everyone has a motor car, and uh, a lot of the, 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 the elements of the qualities, uh, you know, uh, age, um, poverty aspects, and uh, mobility aspects are better addressed by public transport. Well, maybe I can follow that up <coughs> with the clerks. Yes, indeed. The, Thank you very much. Uh, page 13. Okay. Um, the, there have been one or two suggestions then made. If, if the committee are happy that I would take those up with the clerks and make sure that they're included in the report and then publish the report subject to those uh, points being taken, I, I think they're non-contentious and it, it doesn't need to come back to the committee if you're happy for me to do that. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, that really con that concludes the... Uh, items of the agenda that will be taken in public uh, session. Therefore, we're going to move into private session and therefore would like to close the meeting. Thank you.